Today is September the 17th, 2019. Our thought for today is not what you, it's not what you got, it's what you use that makes a difference in how your life turns out. That's Zig Zagler. I'm gonna go ahead and officially call this board meeting to, to order tonight. Uh, tonight I'm excited. Uh, we have a special guest with us tonight. Uh, someone who's a father figure to me. I've been around all my life. Uh, Pastor um, Eddie Tomlinson, Eddie, Eddie Tomlinson of Good Hope Baptist Church. Uh, sir, if you would please come tonight. I remember when I was about seven, eight years old, his, um, his church bus used to come and pick us up, the whole neighborhood, and, and take us to um, Sunday school and take us to vacation Bible study. And uh, back then he had a big old afro. And, I, and, I, and he had a whole lot of hair back then. Pastor, thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And let me thank the Board of Commissioners for the invite. I've been invited several times to come and do this, but this is the first time that my schedule has allowed me to be able to be with you. So thank you so much for the invite. Um, yes, I am Ida Thomas, I'm the pastor of Good Hope Baptist Church out on Highway 162 in the Spring Hill community. I've been serving as the pastor there for the past 37 years. Man. And so, yes, I remember Commissioner Baines when he was just a little boy. And, and my prayer is with, for him is that his ways has changed somewhat drastically. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and yes, I did have a head full of hair and big afro. Polk chop sideburns that met my mustache, but over the years, I changed barbers and he never asked me how I want my hair cut, he just does it. <laughs> so, so, so we thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and if you're ever out in the Spring Hill community on any given Sunday morning, do come by and fellowship with us at the Good Hope Church. We would be delighted to have you. And if Good Hope can ever be of any service to you and to the county, don't, fear, don't hesitate <clears throat> to call upon us. We would certainly render our service to you. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this hour. Thank you for these, your people. We thank you for what you're doing and what you have done and what you will do. And Father, we pray that you allow your spirit to be a part of this meeting tonight, that, it, that we will make wise and just decisions that will lead and guide your people. And then we pray that you will bless those decisions that have been made, that they will be fruitful and multiply. This is in our other blessing we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor, thank you um, for being here tonight. Uh, at the Good, Good Hope Church has hosted uh, a lot of different county meetings, community meetings there. Uh, uh, I think Splash meetings, I think Solid Waste Authority meetings. And we just thank you for what you do in this community. Uh, thank your church for always having the doors open uh, to help out this community. And I have a little token tonight that I want to give to you. Mr. Chairman, can I say one thing while we're back to the seat? Uh -huh. uh, first of all, Pastor, I just want to thank you personally, you and the Spring Hill community, for, for a few years back coming to my defense when we, you, and you, you and the church family and the church family and the community came here and they pulled the building up and said, no, it's not going to be done that way. And, and <coughs> I want to just publicly thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Next, we have our uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I'm going to ask if um, we'll ask Mr. Kerr if he will lead us tonight. Thank you, sir. I pledge Commissioner, you had an opportunity to look at the agenda tonight. I seek a motion that we approve. 
It's been motioned by Commissioner Schultz and second by Commissioner Mason. All in favor? Thank you. Passes five to zero. <clears throat> this is an opportunity that we allow citizens to come up and speak on agenda topics only. You have three minutes to do so. Please state your name, your address for the record, please. You have three minutes to do so. You may come up and talk about agenda topics only. <clears throat> agenda topics only. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, old business. Our um, BOC minutes uh, from July 23rd. I seek a motion that we approve, please. Mr. Chairman, since I ask that those be tabled, I move for approval of the July 23rd meeting. Can I get a second, please? It's been motioned by Commissioner Schultz and second by Commissioner Henderson. Any discussion? All in favor? It passes five to zero. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, next is the chairman's report. Uh, Main Street is going to be doing fireworks again. Uh, I want to poll the board. The judges say it's okay to, to move forward with it um, as long as they clean up after themselves. Um, so I just want to poll the board and make sure they're okay with it. Commissioner Edwards. Commissioner Mason. Commissioner Schultz. Yes. Commissioner Henderson. Well, I have just one question. Tell me. So they gonna be doing the fireworks at the um, on top of the courthouse. They're gonna be doing the fireworks for the for the lighting of the square uh, on top of the. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you, uh, Commissioner uh, Cow. Thank you. Um, next, we have another special guest with us tonight. Um, um, Commissioner Schultz has been in contact um, with her, and so I'm gonna let her in, introduce. Uh, our company tonight, if you will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so those of you that attended the town hall meeting on the ethylene oxide may remember Dr. Abby Mudick. Um, Dr. Mudick has a PhD and is a certified nurse midwife and environmental health researcher at Emory University. She is a professor in the School of Nursing and her research focuses on chemical exposures to pregnant women and to children. As a member of the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit, she works with communities in the southeastern United States to provide health information related to environmental exposures to women and children. So I invited Dr. Mutic and she brought Nathan Mutic with her as well. They are both here tonight from the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit and um, they're gonna make a brief presentation and then be available for the Board of Commissioners to ask them questions. So, Dr. Mutic, if you would um, come to the stand, uh, to the podium, please. We do have a zoning at 7:30 tonight, so we may have to interrupt at some point, and then we'll start back over where we left off at. Thank you. Hello. Woo, it's hey. hot. Hey. <laughs> Thank you again for the invitation to come, um, Dr. Um, I'm sorry, Commissioner uh, Schultz asked me to just kind of give a brief overview of the information that I presented um, at the community meetings, uh, the town hall that was here, and then I also was present at the one in uh, Smyrna. And I will try to be brief um, because I know you guys have a lot of questions and you really want to sort through some of these issues. Um, so let me once again kind of explain who I am. So the Pediatric Environmental Specialty Unit is a group of uh, healthcare providers. And we also have expertise in environmental health science. And so we bridge that gap that many uh, researchers and clinicians have a hard time um, doing. With that, we don't have um, independent ties to anyone in particular. And so that makes us very appealing um, to come and present at things like this because we don't have, um, we don't have to follow any certain roles. 
Um, so the information that I want to give you is um, specifically related to the information that I've gathered um, in my team about health effects and what we know that the chemical ethylene oxide can contribute to. The information is limited, so it's grim, because um, until recently, we didn't know it to be really something that was needed to spend our time and energy in collecting um, increased data. There's a lot of um, issues that are related to how to interpret the data, and so I will try as simply as possible to go through that with you. The information that we have that we really are able to um, give you symptoms as well as um, predictions about long-term health effects is based on a study of about 18,000 workers. And the workers were mostly men, and they were a worker in an industrial ETO plant. And of those workers, um, they experienced the symptoms of nausea, of gastroenteritis, um, of dizziness, and then other health effects like um, confusion and other CNS effects. We don't have good information about pregnant women, and we don't have good information about children. But what we do know is that women, pregnant women and children are among our most vulnerable, as well as the elderly. And the reason why they're so vulnerable is pretty clear. Um, but it's because of their immune system, and it's because of their development. So the brain is constantly developing in utero as well as up until about five years of age where it starts to stabilize. And until then, it's very um, penetrable, and it can cause um, the brain cells to um, not differentiate and develop as normal. And so that's why that age group is particularly uh, vulnerable. And then the elderly, because again, their immune system and because of their chronic disease comorbidities. So a little bit about ETO. Um, we know that it does not stay in the body long. Um, it is excreted um, within 45 minutes to 60 minutes. So this is really important when you're talking about when to collect a sample from a human person, um, because most of the time, you're, by the time you receive their blood, it's not gonna be tied to a, an acute exposure. We think that it does um, accumulate over time, but we have no idea what levels are needed to cause that accumulation. So therefore, if we were to receive a sample that has elevated, I could tell you nothing about how long that person has been accumulating. Um, the other important thing is to remember that the average of 0.1 to 0.3, you've probably heard of this, micrograms per cubic uh, meter, is an average across the country. So what an average means, remember, is that some fall below and some fall above. And that is our normal baseline, uh, meaning without any kind of um, added industrial exposures. We know that that data really differentiated, is differentiated based on the location. So locations that are more rural, um, the, the natural pristine land, um, limited um, inhabitants, those levels are much lower on that low end of average. And then urban areas like Atlanta, um, levels are on the higher if not above. Beyond that, areas that are closer to those um, sterilization sites that we know to be emissions, um, they're higher than that. So we can put those pieces together um, to say, okay, well, we know that this site is a problem. We know that we can assume higher levels because of the geography and because of, of the industrial sites nearby. Once we gather that information, we're like, well, how, how far does it drift, right? How, how far does the emission go outside of the plant? We don't know. That's why they're trying to do these tests. We think it travels less than a mile. We have no idea based on weather, geography, temperature, how quickly it dis, um, disperses in the air. So what we are trying to 
impress upon others is this idea that gathering data uh, small right outside the door versus a few steps beyond that versus a little bit further versus a little bit further may give us an idea over time how that disperses. So without telling you anything concrete, um, I'm telling you that we need more information um, about how far out of the plant area it drifts because without that data, we cannot even begin to put the pieces together about health data. Um, we do know that the dose makes the poison. So if there are higher concentrations in a short amount of time, um, clearly that is uh, easier to link to health data. The small amounts over time, meaning greater than a year to two years, is very hard to put it all together. There's something in, um, in the toxicology world that we call acute, intermediate, and long-term. And we define that by saying acute is within two weeks. So if you do data collection less than two weeks, that is an acute exposure. And you have to keep it in that acute exposure realm in order to um, talk about health effects. Intermediate would be two weeks to a year. And long term would be greater than one year. Let me just make sure that I have that correct. One year. Yes, that's right. Two weeks to one year is the intermediate. That's important when you're talking about um, are the symptoms that are in this community related to the exposures that we're collecting today? Um, I think the last thing I wanted to, to talk about before um, you guys are able to ask your questions that are specific is that the importance of research design in this process because without good, thoughtful, realistic, and methodical data collection, meaning the timing, the length of um, the length of data collection, the time of day, the information that we gather from um, geography and from uh, wind and rain and any kind of humidity out there, as well as um, the frequency. All of that plays a huge role in what we can do with the data once we receive it. Um, if it's not methodically designed um, with a scientific question in mind, we're not able to really do as much with that. There's too many limitations to the data, and it doesn't mean anything. Thank you. Um, Commission, we have a couple of minutes before I have to go into zoning. Uh, who want to go first? Uh, Commissioner Henderson. Well, I, I just, the question I have, and, and maybe um, and I've been to a, a lot of meetings, does ethylene oxide, does it cause cancer? I mean, does it? So it is now listed as a carcinogen, which means, yes, it has the potential to cause cancer. Those are based on um, animal models. And so the answer, short answer is yes. The long-term answer is I don't know how much would cause yes, cancer. Yes, and, and I understand that. And, 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 I, and I've heard a lot of talk. But if you go out into the community and you are on them doors and you see the young lady who's got breast cancer, mm -hmm. I mean, you say, well, you know, they think it may have come from it, but we, we know it. They uh, publish it that it caused cancer. And if you go over to the uh, housing projects and, and tell the young lady who just had um, twins and lost one of her children and say, well, you know, it's, you know, you could or could not, and we think this or we think that, and they don't even know. Or if you go social circle, I think I'm, um, we were talking, say it's about 20 miles, I thought about 30 or 40 miles away, about 20 miles from from Covington, and those people, I mean, they are really scared because they believe in the, in the data that, that uh, they have, maybe not a professor, the data they have say that it caused cancer, and they're scared, and they don't see the reason why we are not doing more than what we're doing. And I believe that we should, you know, 
And um, I love Emory uh, University because, uh, um, you know, in, in Alpha, it's the birthplace of Emory University and our, our visit, and it's, it's also in, in our district. And we have a lot of smart people who, who are there, and, and which we appreciate, and that's what we need. But if you could walk to the doors, as I have, talk to the people over in Covenant Mills, young lady who had, had a double um, uh, breast cancer. And I think you, I know I had a whole different perspective on it. And I think we really need to get to the bottom of it. And I think, you know, if, and if we are wrong with all the presentation, they say, well, it's nothing wrong. So, you know, we're going to get testing. So how many other people are going to have cancer that may you can, that you may be able to um, help save them and can, you know, rather than just keep on waiting and waiting and then more people um, may possibly lose their health and possibly in their lives. And so that's, that's my concern. Yes, and thank you, that's clearly valid. And I, I think as um, leaders, we have to be really careful when we're talking to people um, with these real illnesses and real diseases um, and, and being um, able to pinpoint it on one thing because I see it as, you know, the, the lifetime risk of cancer is one in three. So every third person is going to get cancer before you die. I mean, that's it's gut-wrenching, right? It's, just, it's sickening. But that's reality. And it doesn't tell us what caused it. There's a million things that cause cancer. And we probably all are exposed to lots of things at once that contributes. So when we talk to people um, that are experiencing these, these conditions, um, just because they know one more thing today that contributes doesn't mean that that one thing caused it. And it's we would love nothing more as a medical profession than to pinpoint it and get rid of it, um, to ban it. That's what we would all love to do. Um, but it's not that simple. And I wish that we could find out what it is. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Just one follow-up question. I'd be mm -hmm. doing this, Jeff. Uh, the question that I have, this is a uh, $16 billion uh, plant. And we have several here in Covington. And they have had the... the um, best attorneys in the state of Georgia to uh, defend them in public relations people. I think, you know, being a good citizen, if what most people are saying, and I think all the data come back to the, you know, it doesn't cause this, it doesn't cause that, then why would we be building up a wall against the, in the community that they asked to come in to build their plants? and build up a wall against them. And not only them, you know, SRG did the same thing. They went out and got the best lawyers in the state of Georgia and public relations folks just to quiet it down so they can continue to do business. That, you know, and, and, and I personally believe, and I'll tell you where I'm at, I can't speak to nobody else. I said then, and I said now, that until we can kind of, until we can get this crisis under control, that we need to pull their permit locally. And, and so they will won't be able to do business in Covington in Newton County until we get this under control. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Mewton. We have a um, zoning hearing that we have to do at 7.30. I promise you it won't take long. Um, so we're gonna call you back up as soon as the zoning hearing is over. Would that be okay? Of course. All right, thank Whatever you so much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, commissioners, write down your question. Um, so you better ask him once you come back up. Thank you. Um, Miss Judy, if you would, please come up. <clears throat> this is item number 15 on your agenda tonight. Thank Good you. Good evening, Chairman Good evening. and board members. Um, tonight we only have one zoning uh, petition before you to consider, and it is located in District 5. This is a conditional use uh, permit request to allow a home occupation to be operated from an accessory structure. The property is located at 600 Starsville Road and it's on 1.28 acres. It's zoned agricultural residential 
and um, the the way the ordinance reads, the section of the ordinance that it pertains to is section 510, 310, subsection I, where it says, if you're doing a home occupation, the use shall be conducted entirely within the dwelling unit. Approval through a conditional use permit is required for a home occupation located in accessory buildings. So if our applicant was requesting to just operate a home occupation from the property, <coughs> then they would be able to do that. But the fact that they want to use an accessory building in conjunction with this requires them to come before this board in order to get a conditional use permit. Um, the Planning Commission did hear this on August the 27th. They did recommend approval, but they did add some additional conditions. Again, this gives you an idea of where the property is located. If you can see the highlighted little blue parcel, it is uh, 600 Starsville Road. The zoning is agricultural, uh, residential, and it is between Highway 213 and, I'm not as familiar with my roads, my apology. Oh my goodness, I don't know what the other main road is that's on the other end of Starsville. Elks Club, Elks Club Road, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, here is an overview of the property itself. Again, the property is 1.28 acres. It does have a single family residential home on it. And the request is to place the building to the rear of the property. In agricultural residential zoning, there is no restriction to the size of the building, nor is there a restriction in ag zoning. Um, there is a restriction to the amount of impervious surface, uh, which they have not exceeded, but they have, uh, they had the right to construct a building. They just did not have the right to use the building in relation to the home occupation. Um, the next slide is to show their site plan. They are proposing, and it is included in the conditions of zoning, to add some additional plannings between the structure and the street view of Starsville Road to kind of give a, um, a landscape or a buffer so it's not as visible when you're coming down the road. So again, our planning commission did recommend approval, but they did ask, if this is approved, they would like for you to consider the following um, conditions. If this is approved by the Board of Commissioners, it should be approved for a conditional use permit for a landscaping business, conditional subject to the owner's agreement to the following enumerated conditions. One, to the owner's agreement to restrict the conditional use of the accessory structure as follows storage of vehicles and equipment for landscaping business. Two, any and or all required approvals for building permits shall be submitted and approved by Newton County Development Services Department prior to the issuance of a business license. Building permit must be obtained within six months of approval of the conditional use permit. Three, no customer contact will be allowed. Four, conditional use permit to be brought back to the Planning Commission for review two years after approval date to confirm the use is kept in compliance with the conditions. And five, the landscape plan to be approved by the Newton County Landscape Architect. We had conditions one and two originally. The Planning Commission did ask to add for it to be brought back in front of them in two years, which we do have the right by ordinance because it is a conditional use on residential property. And then they also asked for the landscape plan to be approved by the Newton County Landscape Architect. Um, I do believe that since this uh, petition was originally uh, drafted, that the building had, I don't know that it's received a final CO, but again, they had the right to construct the building. They just didn't have the right to use it in conjunction with the business. I do believe they have an active building permit. The building may actually be up. I did not confirm whether or not it was closed, but before we would issue a business license to the property, should this board approve it, we will confirm that all of these things have been uh, met. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it is approximately 7.33. Um, this portion of our public hearing where we allow the applicant and those in support of this to come up and speak now. You have 10 minutes to do so. Please state your name, your address for the record, please. Anyone in favor of this tonight? 
Anyone in favor tonight? Please state your name, your address for the record, please. Corey Johnson, 600 Starsville Road. I'll be the owner of the, you know, the building and uh, I'll be the one using it for my business. I mean, I don't, <laughs> you know, yeah, every, yeah. everything's on the table of what I want to do. So I, mean, I really don't have a lot to say other than, you know, uh, I will be using it for my business and we will abide by all the rules that it's uh, laid out on the line. Sounds good. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to speak in favor? Anyone else want to speak in favor? Thank you. That portion of our public hearing is closed. We also allow 10 minutes for those that want to oppose tonight. You may come at this time. Please state your name and your address for the record, please. Anyone that wants to oppose tonight? You may come at this time. Anyone wants to oppose tonight? Thank you. Um, that portion of our public hearing is closed. Uh, Commissioner Cowan, seek a motion, please. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve the additional new permit 19 Can you speak in the mic, please? I'm sorry. Location 600 Starsville Road. Uh, with the recommended conditions of the uh, planning board. It's been motioned by Commissioner Cowan and second by Commissioner um, Edwards. Any discussion? Yes, I have one question. Commissioner Cowan. Judy, if you don't mind. Um, if Mr. Um, Johnson's, is Johnson, if Mr. Johnson sells his property, what happens to the condition of his permit? Does it go away? The conditional, it, that would be, it. when the planning commission reviews it in two years, um, they would have the right if the property was no longer in Mr., uh, uh, not no longer operated by the applicant and, and it swapped hands, they would have the right to um, review that at that time and move forward with asking for a revocation Generally, conditional uses do follow the land, but our ordinance in the administration, we have two ways in which a conditional use can be removed. We can either have it by the planning commission's review, or we can have it by the zoning administrator initiating a request, which would come back in front of this board. So there is a way for it not to be tied to the property. You may want to entertain adding a condition that it would be specific for and maybe get Mr. Johnson's name of his business. And if we tied it to that business, only that business would be able to operate the conditional use. That would be a third way to make sure that it only followed with this particular request. Now they can only operate a landscape business from the property. So you would have to have a, a perfect marriage of a sale of a property with someone wanting to operate well, the landscape. My, my thought would be if the property was sold, uh, another owner would use it for a, just a storage building, barn, car, whatever he puts in there, which I think is still allowed in AR zoning. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. If so, you have so a storage structure, you can store your personal in, items in, in the it. the course of this, it really doesn't matter per se in some situations does it, the permit may go away as additional use, but the building would not have to be removed. Correct. Because it could be a, a different use. Correct. Yes, okay. sir. Yes, sir. The building would be lawful just as mm -hmm. an accessory to the property. What, what I was trying to do is a subsequent buyer to the property, buying the property with a building on it, and then finding out that we pull the conditional use permit and it's got to tear the building down. I would not want that. Oh, no, sir. No, sir. That would not happen. But there's also just... Again, for the board's knowledge, there is provisions when we have allowed special uses on properties if they are not operated in the way in which you want to. And I have no reason to doubt that this one will be operated correctly, but we do have provisions to help protect mm -hmm. the county and property owners. Okay, I'm fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Thank you. All in favor? The pass is five to zero. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Uh, Meepnik, if you would, please, if you guys would come back. Uh, board members, please remember that uh, 
She is here to give us information and information alone. Um, she's not here to make any kind of decisions or anything like that. So if you want to make comments, please make them in your commissioner comments. Uh, but if you got questions, please ask her questions. All right, thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you have mentioned earlier about testing and once we complete testing, we can really kind of start looking at um, health data. And so we know currently that um, our city council is doing testing and um, it should be completed within sometime around October. So would we be able to take that data from their air testing and be able to provide some of the health data that you referenced earlier in your statement? No, because it's gonna be air data and not um, person data. So you're gonna be able to give an, an estimate of the concentrations within the, if I understand where the sites are, the eight sites that are right. within one mile, mm -hmm. you'll be able to give an average concentration of what people are exposed to one mile around the um, site. Mm -hmm. And that won't tell us anything about what is, what is in people. So that's a different study. So to add to that, and you had mentioned about there was a certain time frame that you would have to test the actual body. I think you said 45 minutes. That's correct. So would we have to identify specific individuals to actually do that testing? And would they had to have been exposed within about 45 minutes before we can do that testing to make that declaration that it came from this particular source? So... In order to look at acute data, meaning acute exposure, you're absolutely correct. Um, if you wanted to look at, if a person lives around one mile radius for the last you know, 10 years, um, and you wanted to see what their average was over time, then you would want to include data from various points of time over time. And that would give you a lot more data points um, and you would be able to give a bigger picture about what is the body burden of that person that lives near X plant for X amount of time because you're frequently you know, testing their blood at, at random times during the day or you know, during the week and that gives you more information about intermittent um, exposures. And then if you looked at it for over a year, then you're looking at chronic exposures. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, and just to introduce myself, my name's Nathan Mudick. We do happen to be married. She's the brains of the operation. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, my role is I'm an associate director of research projects um, in the School of Nursing. I'm also the project manager for the Southeast PESU. Um, so just to say up front, I don't have any clinical background or expertise, but when it comes to research design, um, I could tell you that, you know, if I believe the question is, could we link air testing data to levels in someone's blood and then link that to health outcomes, that would be a really an incredibly diff difficult experiment to design, even if that was the intent. Um, and one of the big problems with that is confounding variables. So we know that ethylene oxide doesn't just come from plants where it's produced. Um, it can also be found from car exhaust. It can be found in tobacco smoke. Um, ethylene oxide's used to, some exposure might come from products that it's used to sterilize. So some spices, some cosmetics. Um, there's also off-gassing off of ethylene oxide from uh, substances like PVC pipe. So there could be baseline levels in your home or in the air that you're breathing in the environment that you live in um, that are coming from all of these different sources. So it'd be really difficult, one, <clears throat> to do the testing in the plant and be able to link that to a blood level and a health outcome, um, let alone determine 
Is it maybe coming from car exhaust? Is it coming from tobacco smoke? Um, and then also with health outcomes, there's confounding risk variables there. So does that person also smoke? Um, do they drink alcohol? What are their other risk factors that could be contributing to some of the health outcomes that we're seeing? And so you'd really need a, an incredibly large sample size um, to be able to connect some of those dots. Not saying it's impossible and not advocating for or against it, but just that it would be a very difficult experiment to design if you were a researcher going in there trying to answer that research question. So it will really behoove us to focus on overall health and wellness versus one specific thing is causing this specific disease or health issue. So we really need to, because based off of what you're saying, it's gonna be challenging for us to really say that one particular thing is causing some type of dis-ease. So what we really have to do is, as a community, uh, address the concern, but then in addition to that, really focus on personal individual health and wellness. If I'm, if I'm correct. I mean, this is totally opinion, which is what you guys did not ask me to do. Um, but, you know, you need some information about what are your exposures related to this plant. And so in a very well-constructed manner, I'm not sure what the city has offered, and I'm not sure what researchers are on that, um, but I would highly recommend some air pollution experts um, to make sure that it's done well. Don't waste your money if it's not done well because it's not gonna tell you what you want. And so that's something to look at. The other thing to look at would be um, what, what do we wanna do with the information? Um, how are we gonna act on it when I know that there is a number? Say it's low, what are we gonna do? Say it's high, what are we gonna do? And um, I think if you can answer those questions amongst yourself, then it makes it a little bit more clear. But you're right, when we start talking about health outcomes, I'm not sure that, that, that your city is, is robust enough um, to really even give you the sample size you're looking for. Thank you. Thank you, um, Commissioner Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you guys for the information. It's been very helpful. I, I wanna back up and ask a question about some of the information that you provided earlier. And it has to do with the higher levels in the, if I heard this right, I'm paraphrasing it, the, the higher levels detected in the bodies in the urban versus the rural areas. And that's the ethylene oxide detected in the bodies versus in those two areas. Those are air, air samples, not, air the, sample. not okay. body samples. All right, mm -hmm. so air samples. Um, so, and you mentioned Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So there, there's the plant in Smyrna. Mm -hmm. So were you using Atlanta hypothetically or Atlanta specifically? Because I asked that because it, would those levels be, would the air test, the levels in the air, ambient air be test higher in say an urban area that had no ethylene oxide plant? And I don't know if Smyrna can impact Atlanta's air quality anyway. I mean, I, I don't know that. So, uh, so, so Atlanta may be a perfectly good example, but would there be another example of a city? Would you be, would you be just as comfortable saying Tampa if, if Tampa had no ethylene oxide emitting facility? Would that still hold true, higher ethylene oxides typically in an urban area versus a rural area? Good question, and the answer is yes. It would still hold true, urban versus rural um, is always gonna have more emissions okay. because of the density and because of the amount of people causing pollution. Okay, so you know that there, there's, a, there's some underlying factors there obviously, and, and I heard, I believe it was, if I remember correctly, the, a, the EPA, had done some ETO testing in another state with no ethylene oxide facility, emitting facility. And they were above the EPA, uh, tested way outside the limits of the EPA at that time also. So that just creates even more questions about what's really causing the ETO in our communities. Right, I mean, would you agree with that, that question? Yes, and I'm not sure um, which incident you're referring to, but I do. I did learn about when we were here and at Smyrna that they did a random site testing because of their air, their 
their grounded chronic or no um uh they they have an air site pollution outside of Decatur that um collect samples over time all year round. And then that is a very stable source of their data collection. And that tested 0.336. Um, and what we were learning is that the levels outside of Smyrna were around that number. Say that again, I'm sorry. 0.336 is what the Decatur, Decatur random sample was, which is pretty far from Smyrna. Um, you know, the, the data that we have would say that the air could not be contributed to that, that plant or that site. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Thank, thank you. Um, anyone else? Uh, Commissioner Schultz? <clears throat> I, I'm, I have to say that I'm just really spellbound by some of the uh, information that you're providing, and I thank you very much. I think that one of the things that we are all concerned about is provide as leaders and as commissioners, we've all had someone that's been impacted by cancer. My mother, my father, both were impacted by cancer. Um, so we are very concerned about the health of our community and the safety of our community. And we don't want to ignore the fear that's out there, but we also don't want to ratchet up the fear and, cre and create even more fear. And so one of the things that um, I hear is that there are risks and benefits to, in, to adding to testing. And so help me just um, understand that where the risks are by us adding to testing and where the benefits are by adding to the testing because what we would be responsible for would be adding testing sites in the county. Yeah. Okay. So, so just to clarify the question is what are the risks that you add by testing and what are the risks that you could resolve by testing? Yes. Yeah. So in other words, what what are the benefits by by adding county testing versus the risks of contributing to additional mm -hmm. fear or not yeah. being able to get good data or whatever it is. Yeah, I think, I mean, the just taking it back a step further is making sure that you, you're setting yourself up to be in a position where you um, could get more information that's helpful. And so by saying we're doing testing um, without having that start to finish plan of how are we testing? How are we coordinating with other groups that are doing testing? And what are we going to do with that information? Um, just to clarify, if, if that's not done, testing doesn't, it may not add that much, you know, in terms of helping the community. Um, the other risk about, um, conversely, if that is well established, we've worked with some experts. And just to clarify, we're not experts in testing. Um, our group uh, has special specializes in this expert in the health effects specifically to women and children. Um, so I'm, I would say that, you know, you'd want to work with someone who has that expertise in the testing. And then the, the potential downfall is that you might be missing an opportunity to put resources, for example, to reduce the emissions in the first place. Um, and so that could mean working with the, the plant um, to find ways to reduce um, fugitive emissions or ways to improve um, what's coming out of the stacks. So in other words, if we do testing, it may undermine that ability to to work with the to work with the source that we know is in fact the source. Is that it could be. I mean I don't know how much what your resources are um, and if there's enough to do the testing and work with work on lowering the emissions in the first place, then maybe not. Um, and I don't know how much testing costs, but I'm assuming it's expensive. So he mentioned fugitive versus stacks. Are you guys clear on the difference? Okay, so fugitive emissions are those emissions that are happening inside the facility. And I do not know BD's protocols. Um, I doubt they share those, <laughs> but um, we could find out and they should be accessible. So what that means is sterilization companies 
um, generally have protocols of the process of sterilization. And I know at Sterogenics, they have released those. And um, for their processing, they require 260 day plus days uh, after it has gone through a phase of sterilization for the products to be open to um, regular temperature air. And they have to be idle. And so during that process, off-gassing occurs. We have no clue what that contributes to the overall um, emissions outside of the plant. Obviously, it's contributing, but we are not able to <clears throat> identify what's coming from the fugitive emission and what's coming from the stacks above. Um, so that's important because right now, the solutions that they've implemented um, to the public uh, has been to reduce their stack emissions. So things like this could be really valuable for y'all's involvement um, if we could dig a little deeper into the plant's protocols. So since you said that, I got a quick question. Um, so if we do testing, will we be actually testing chem um, emissions that's coming from uh, BD if we do testing out in the county, which would be more than a mile away? The research would... doesn't support that. Um, what I would consider doing is, it sounds like the way they've set it up so far is eight sites within one mile, two without, um, outside. Okay, so it sounds like what they're using is then as a, as a comparison. So your, your county data would be your baseline mm -hmm. um, of what we say is 0.1 to 0.3 for the U entire United States. So the one mile radius is what we would consider to be um, the, the plant emissions. But it could be beneficial to add testing to that less than one mile because maybe a quarter of a mile is you know, significantly higher than one mile. And we just don't know what the air dispersion is like in that zero so, to one mile. So are you saying that if the county do testing, we should test inside the city limits a one mile before, I mean, one mile away from that, well, less than a mile, actually. I, I mean, I don't think mile. we can suggest a data plan yeah, or a I sampling think. plan, but to me, we don't know that information and it seems much more valuable than looking outside of, the, of that one mile. But that's not, our group's right. expertise and so you definitely want to follow up and ask that question to someone who is an expert in air pollution, air pollution monitoring um, that's just really not something that our that we have the research background or experience to answer that question directly some suggestions could be you know atsdr who's the toxicology um, source they're not attached to epa they're independent um, or you could go even outside of that and do like Emory or Georgia Tech. Um, some of those specialists would be really valuable to that question. Okay. Commissioner Anderson. Commissioner Anderson. Sorry, I didn't hear you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> You're talking loaded like right me sometimes. Um, so most of those plants, at least the one here in Covington, you know, um, are close to poor neighborhoods. You know where, uh, like uh, the housing projects. Now, the deal was identified. They said, "Well, the, this is the radius in which possibly the, uh, I guess the uh, ethylene oxide may uh, go to Silver Grove and, and Covington and Covington Neal. So, I guess the, the, the question that I'm asking is, what about those folks? Because it, it, we, we, I'm hearing a whole lot of people coming, but nobody's talking about the people's in the community, the people who who are left over there with almost defenseless, and and, and everybody saying, well, it's it's okay, there's nothing wrong with it, but yet you go out and, and whatever happened to people, you go out and ask somebody or try to find what's going on, and right now I think we saying it's a, we don't know. And then say, just the air. So it's not the air. Uh, maybe you need to go and uh, talk to an individual. Maybe you need to uh, hire another specialist. But we're doing nothing. But yet, yet and still those same folks that they identified, when nobody identified, they did the map and put it on TV and told the folks, 
that uh, ethylene oxide cause cancer. And what we tell those those poor folks, and most of them is is in district court. With them. So wait, wait a minute, uh, ain't nothing wrong. <laughs> you okay? And yet, you know, uh, nobody's held accountable. And the people are looking to the, the leaders to stand up for them. And so forth, we're not doing that, in my opinion. We're talking about all the reasons why we can't, and it should be talking about the reason why we can. So give me a question, ask her a question. Well, this, this I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make, gonna close it out right now. No, ask her, ask her a question. The question please. is, yeah. what are we gonna do to help those folks? That's something that you can I mean, ask the And That's I guess I'm addressing that question to you, just to see, what are we gonna do to help those folks and my fellow commissioners? See, because most of you can go out there on the outer side of the county and breathe fresh air, or what you think is fresh air, on the other side of the county and breathe a fresh air, or what you think is fresh air. What about us here in town that are struggling and that nobody has visited not one house, talked to one person? And we know that by we saying we're testing air, if it was a high, uh, high emission of ethylene oxide, then it wouldn't be, because we've heard on TV that they close the plant down and do whatever they need to do in order to um, for it to be little, so to be negative, so to be low. So the question is, what do we do? And I think out of all the, the uh, questions that have been answered, I have an answer to it. Close it down, then find out what to do. Thank you, sir. Anyone, that, anyone else? Don't forget, uh, if you do testing while the plant is closed, you won't find you you won't find anything in the air for sure. <laughs> okay, um, Commission. I mean, uh, County Manager Kerr, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just, I was curious, um, you mentioned earlier that their ethylene oxide was present in exhaust gases from an automobile. Um, and there were some, several other sources. For instance, you mentioned PVC pipes. Has there been any testing or is there, are there, is there any information that says how much ethylene oxide does the average car produce in a year's time? Um, is that information out there? Is that available? That's a great question that I don't know the answer to. Yeah. You? I don't I don't know, but um, we can definitely follow up. So, yeah, we can look and see so, if there's an estimated yeah. so the, from diesel. And the reason I ask that is I, is because, you know, the person who works, for instance, at the Kroger store at the Kroger in the booth in there is breathing that in all day long. Mm -hmm. Would their exposure be the same, say, as somebody who either lives or works close to BD. Now you're thinking like a researcher. Pardon me? Now you're thinking like a researcher. <laughs> so, and the other thing too, for instance, with the PVC pipe, if it does, again, you know, what amount would it emit? Because if I heard you correctly, then somebody who works at Home Depot may be subjected, if they work in the plumbing department and they're around the PVC pipe quite a bit, they may be subjected to that and not even know it. And they may have worked there for a number of period of years or the customers for that matter, I guess. Um, so, uh, you know, have there been, again, it's sort of the same question. Has there been any information on how much that someone might be exposed to something like that? Or how much does, how many pounds mm -hmm. per year does it give off, you know? That, I don't think mm -hmm. we know that. Um, mm -hmm. But we can check and get back to you. I'm pretty sure there's not data on that. The, it, most of the data is from the study that she mentioned mm -hmm. earlier with the 18,000 workers in the plant. Um, and, and the levels in the blood, was that mm -hmm. done from actual blood tests or was that determined based on a, using modeling or how was that? I, I know you said that you can't determine. From what the, worker period, the worker study? I'm sorry? From the workers study? Yes, yes. That was blood and urine. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was no way to determine how much exposure or how many year, whatever period of time would, how, how long it would take to indicate that you had, a, or that you would find residuals or residue of that inside someone's blood, correct? Is that That's right? correct. It's more of an acute exposure at that point. So do you know, um, do people absorb the uh, gas at the same rate? For instance, if you and I were exposed, that stuff was blowing at us, would 
I absorb it at the same rate that you would? That's a great question. Um, the answer is if you are an adult that has a normal respiratory rate, so as long as you don't have a, a respiratory illness or asthma, we would probably um, breathe at the same rate, but children actually breathe a lot faster. Mm -hmm. um, and they, because they're so small, they actually take in a lot more of the chemical. But you don't know what the rate is that you uh, accumulate that in your blood. Is that right? That That's that right, because that? that depends on things like um, metabolism and your excretion rate mm -hmm. and any kind of issues related to your kidneys or your liver when and, they're processing the chemical. Or, I guess, other exposure to other things that may... That may have, change the chemical or slow right. it down. That's right. There's so many factors. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Got anything else? I would just like to say, too, um, to address Commissioner Henderson's points and questions about what can we do. I think, um, you know, it would be smart to maybe view this as a starting point for this conversation. We're always here um, with the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit. Um, again, we specialize in the health effects, but we're here to answer those questions. Um, happy to talk anytime. And then if there are questions we can address, um, we're fairly well connected to the, the individuals that might be able to answer some of those questions specifically around testing. Um, and so, you know, we can leave our information. We'd be happy to follow up offline if, if that's something you'd like to do. Okay. We, we might want to do a, uh, I think, I know Commissioner Henderson would, uh, I think we might want to do a work session mm -hmm. uh, with you guys and maybe um, um, some air quality testing. Um, engineers or scientists um so we might want to look at doing that um i see all the board members shaking their heads so um and, and and so we'll try to get you guys to come back and, and do a joint joint uh work session with us um and doing that mm -hmm. okay should okay. we leave those with you specifically or just leave them out at the door or yeah, we'll take them. If you would give them, if Brian, if you would get those, we'll okay. definitely get them. Uh, but guys, we greatly appreciate you coming out uh, and and just giving us giving us the info um, tonight. Uh, as you know, our community has been been affected by this, and there's a uh, there's a uproar in the community, and we want to make sure that we get the right information to to them to the people. And uh, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, one other thing, Mr. Chairman, and I, not to interrupt you, but if we do a work session, could you, in any data that you may bring or any, any thought process you may go through, any research process you may go through before we, we get back together, could you could you factor in the, the fact that this community, this county does not do emissions testing and what that might mean to, um, to, to the overall scope of what we're looking at here? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, uh, so we will be contacting you guys back and hopefully we can get the work session together with some, um, some more air quality te technicians or experts, um, uh, and we'll do another work session, but we greatly appreciate you coming tonight and, and, um, informing the people here. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kerr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. We've got a few uh, few things to show you here on the uh, on the, the magic of the overhead here. Um, we have, during this past month we've had 23 new hires and we've had 25 separations, so our population has remained pretty constant. Um, you next slide, please, Brian. Um, if you look at, you can see the um, uh, number of permits that we're issuing. Um, we've issued uh, 45 uh, new residential permits and we've issued one primary commercial permit and you can see the value of that one primary commercial permit is pretty significant, $40 million. Um, for a total of value of $48 million uh, for the uh, past month. And next slide, please. Um, and that's just a recap of the issue of our uh, permit <coughs> activity. Next slide, please. Uh, public works, uh, you'll see the number of, uh, of uh, work orders there that we've processed. Um, 
with the largest being in District 1 at 104, and the least number of requests that we had were in District 4 with 41. You also see the Elmig resurfacing that's been going on. Um, won't necessarily go through all those, but you'll see that we've been in um, all of the districts except for, for District 5. We've had some SPLOS projects, culvert replacement, uh, Sewell Road, and uh, we're still working on the reclamation in District 5 of White Road. Next slide, please. Um, wanted to bring this to everybody's attention. Uh, Ms. Hayes, <coughs> our Clerk of Superior Court, is offering free notary tra uh, training. So if anyone uh, here in the audience in the county would like uh, to become a notary, um, she's offering the training uh, for free of charge. Um, and uh, uh, it's a good thing to have if somebody in your family will, to be a notary so that uh, you can have documents uh, notarized and so forth. So next slide, please. Um, here's some pictures. Rivers Alive is coming up September 28th. I want to make sure everybody's aware of that. Um, I think the muster place is at the Longhorn Steakhouse. If you show up there in the morning, you'll get a biscuit and coffee, and then you'll uh, get some trash bags and uh, be sent out to help clean up the river. So next slide, please. Um, we are gonna have our strategic plan community meeting on October the 14th. Uh, we will be giving a report to the community on what we've worked on so far and the things that we've achieved and uh, what are becoming, uh, or what is becoming a part of our culture within Newton County government. Next slide, please. And remember one Newton, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The only other things that I wanted to mention to you all and mention to the public is remind everyone of Census 2020 that is coming up. Um, and uh, so we want to make sure everybody responds to the questionnaires and you can go online. You can do it by phone. You can do it on your um, uh, on your laptop or your computer and so forth. So we want to make sure we get a good count. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be part of a leadership training uh, seminar that uh, the Sheriff's Office is sponsoring uh, quite a few people from our county, uh, as well as some of the neighboring counties uh, have been there and from as far as way as South Carolina are taking part. It's an excellent program and I, I think it's something that's really been very worthwhile and and uh, we're holding it over, it's, or rather it's being held over at the Career, College and Career Academy, um, which is helping to show off some of the very positive things about our county. Um, and this morning, um, had an opportunity to uh, make a plug for the county and tell them to spend lots of money before they go home. So um, I also want to remind you, you Steele, who has been our chairman for the elections committee or our elections board for the past 21 years, Mr. Steele is 93 and he's decided it's time to hang up his hat and uh, enjoy retirement a little bit. So there will be a retirement celebration uh, for uh, Mr. Steele on October the 1st here at the courthouse from 4.30 to 6.30. We want everybody to come. And finally, I just, um, we have put together an RFP for a grant writer. Uh, and so what we are wanting to do is to see what is out there and see if, if we can ar arrange to have a grant writer who specializes particularly in public safety and uh, parks and recreation to, uh, do uh, to write grants for us, make applications on a contingency basis. And so we're putting that out there, should hit the street in the next day or so. And um, hopefully that will we'll, um, bring some additional much needed money into our public safety and into our parks and rec department. So thank you, that's all I have. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Commissioner Henderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Lord, a question, so, so I can be clear in, in my mind, we're not going to give them like we did one other time before on the commission. And you wasn't here. And I think I probably was the only person here. We gave somebody $50,000. And the only grant that we received was one from Walmart. And the other one I could have went over there and did myself. So, I um, mean, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that um, uh, this time, so it's on contingency. If they get some, they get a percentage of, of the grant or how that works. Well, there's several different ways to do it. And, and this will all be part of a proposal. But ideally, what we would like to see. I mean, certainly there may be uh, someone who wants to make a proposal on a flat fee, and of course we would consider that, but there are a lot of individuals and companies who will, uh, consulting services, who will write the grant for a percentage of the grant award, and the only time that they make any money 
is when an award is or when a grant is awarded, and so uh, there's that's incentive for them to put together a quality application for us, and it's something that we don't have a lot of expertise in, and also uh, the personnel to do. So this is a way that we can um, uh, uh, really help ourselves and leverage um, what money we would pay to somebody and to, to possibly uh, a large sum of money. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Uh, next is the consent agenda. Uh, we do have a um, appointment tonight in District 2. Uh, Commissioner Mason, you want to introduce your appointment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if he could please stand, Mr. Alan Milhouse. Um, Mr. Milhouse, uh, of course, is married to his wife, Lillian Milhouse, for 14 years and a resident of Newton County for eight years. He's the father of four, one son and three daughters, three grandchildren. He's worked in transportation for 20 years, worked in the TV industry for seven years at TBS. He's a leader in his church, mentored youth uh, and men in the church. He's worked in youth ministry. Uh, worked in outreach ministry, uh, serving the needs of the community. He's worked alongside the Criminal Justice for Reform Committee to advocate and introduce the Ban the Box Initiative bill that Governor Deal passed in 2015 for returning citizens. Uh, he's part of the Returning Citizens Initiative through the governor's office for four years. Uh, he's counseled youth in foster care and group homes. And overall, he just has a passion to serve. And so I am excited to uh, have uh, Mr. Alan Milhouse join our planning commission. Uh, Mr. Milhouse, as you saw tonight, uh, some of what our, our, our planning director uh, talked about, those will be some of the things that you'll be uh, sitting down discussing and, and working through with our planning commission. And so we're excited uh, to have Mr. Alan Milhouse represent District 2. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir, for your willingness to serve this community. I greatly appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, you had an opportunity to look at the consent agenda. I seek a motion, please. It's been motioned uh, by Commissioner Edwards and second by Commissioner um, Mason. Any discussion? All in favor? Passes five to zero. Thank you. Welcome aboard, sir. Um, next is our financial. Um, Ms. Brittany. It's just Brittany's doing a great job uh, filling in, guys. Um, so uh, congratulate her for just help keeping things going. Uh, thank you. Thank Appreciate you. It. Good evening. These are the June 2019 preliminary financials. As we have not um, had our audit yet, so there still could be some changes with some adjusting audit entries at the end. And our auditors are scheduled to be here in October. Okay, the first section I'm going to cover is general fund revenues. So we ended the year at 105% with our revenues. So we did have an increase of revenues and what we budgeted. Mainly our increases were the loss collections and an increase in TVAT. And here's a bar graph just demonstrating how much our revenues were each month this year and another one that shows budget versus actuals. And this section is our general fund expenditures. And we ended the year at 93.39% of our expenditures. We realized most of our savings here in our contingency positions that were not filled throughout the year. Most departments were within around 90 to 98% of what they asked for in the budget. The ones that were not quite at what they asked for were mainly vacant positions. So if someone left and there was a month or two lag where that position wasn't filled, that's where mostly everything that wasn't spent in those budgets. You will see the biggest one, the percentage only being 24% in non-departmental, as I mentioned, the contingency positions. And the facilities budget is, uh, <clears throat> is over budget due to the ABM savings not 
realize the way that they were budgeted this year. And we hope to make up for that in the contingency position so we can do a budget transfer to correct that. And here is uh, just the year-end revenues versus expenditures. And our general fund balance, that generally isn't calculated until year end once audit is complete and all adjusting journal entries are done. So we're still, um, that number could fluctuate depending on any adjusting entries. And our enterprise funds, um, they all had a pretty successful year this year with water fund ending at 102% of their budgeted revenue and only spending 70% of their budgeted expenditures. Solid waste brought in 103% more revenue and their expenditures were only 84% of what they budgeted. And then Gaither's was only at 79% of their revenue budgeted, but they did only spend 71, so they did also end the year on a positive note. 2005 SPLOSS is still open. This has been unchanged since the last time you've seen this slide. We're just finishing up um, paying the COPS administration debt, and that will be, we'll just be paying all that over the next couple years. 2011 is almost wrapped up. We have the fire department who's going to begin the next station, and they're working on RFPs and getting all that finalized now, and then the last remaining project we have is the historic gel project. 2017 SPLOSS, we're in the process now of beginning all the bonded projects, so you should start seeing an increase in that. I will say on this next slide, there is a correction to what's in your agenda packet due to a um, formula error, but we have so far collected 3.5 million in excess of what we had budgeted. So we are on track to collect more for the 2017 SPLOSS. Impact fee funds, we ended the year collecting 979,000 in impact fees. And debt service summary is also unchanged as we do not have any um, debt payments generally in June. And that's it. Mr. Kerr, you have thought? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Brittany, if you would, if you could just go back for a minute and explain the ABM and how that impacted. Um, you and I spoke about it, and I believe there's some issues with the journal, the way the journal entry shows. So for the board's edification. Yeah. There was a credit budgeted in an expenditure account to show a savings that we were going to realize of $425,000, which we did not see that realized in the expenditures of water, sewer, electric, gas. So therefore, the facility's budget is not equal as to realizing the savings. Mr. Kerr? Um, <clears throat> also, the finance department has worked on and uh, is continuing to work on a building by building breakdown. Um, in over the last year, there were savings that were shown the, in this building and with the admin building, but the remainder of the buildings have to be analyzed too. The other um, peculiar thing about that particular line item within the facilities budget is that the guarantee from ABM was only on the buildings that they actually did work on and it was only portions of those buildings where there was actually changes made. So it's taken a long time to get that analysis. And so that's why um, some of the information we have currently is, is, is incomplete. But I did want to make sure that we kind of talked about that for at least a minute. And we're so working on doing an analysis of all the buildings. So hopefully we can get a better budgeted number because would this be in the first year that we needed to budget for the savings, it was kind of just our best guess. And obviously, the 425000 was not um, probably the best number. So once we finish our analysis, we may can look at budgeting that differently in the future. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you so much. Thank you did a great job tonight. Thanks. <clears throat> Next item, number 10, uh, record.
Recreation Commission requ requesting uh, permission to enter into a contract with Atlanta Fire and Restoration, Mr. Kerr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is a, uh, a project, uh, the Dyna uh, Circle Park over there has been underway for quite a while. and There's been uh, improvements that have been made along the way. And this is part of the park improvements in District 4 <coughs> that um, Commissioner uh, uh, Henderson uh, has been working with. This is for a bathroom facility that will be installed there. Um, this does include uh, the the septic system and the drainage field and our drain field and also it the bathroom will be of a type of construction that will be um, destruction resistant and uh, also resistant to uh, vandals so uh, it is an expensive project um, but that's typically what the cost of of an isolated restroom like that would, would run so. thank you sir uh, i seek a motion um Commissioner Henry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it, it, it was a, first of all, if I make the motion, it was a, a special product because we had to do it on the hill on, on the property that we had purchased about, uh, I think, four or five years ago for that community per their request. Mm -hmm. And so it was something that um, had to be done. We budgeted, it was uh, placed on the ballot for the uh, citizens of Noon County to look at uh, to approve. Uh, through uh, splash funding, that and uh, several others. But anyway, make a long story short, they are very happy that we are finally beginning to do their project, their uh, little community park that will be ran by recreation over in the area. And they're very excited and, and hope that it will soon be, be, be um, they'll be through with it so they can give a grand opening. And they hope uh, they'll well over go along with it too as well. So with having said all that, I make a motion to approve as presented by our county manager. Second. It's been motioned by um, Commissioner Henderson and second by Commissioner Schultz. Um, any discussion? All in favor? It passes five to zero, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, GSI is requesting a Approval of 2020 flower of Newton County this winter to acquire aerial imagery, Mr. Kerr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tim Lawrence, our GIS director, is here tonight. I'm going to ask Tim to come up and talk to you a little bit about this flyover and uh, what standard information we hope to gain, as well as some additional information. So, Tim, if you'll come up and talk. Thank you. How you doing? Evening, Mr. Good Chairman. Good evening. Uh, thank you. Um, staff is uh, requesting um, the purchase of a 2020 flyover. Um, we fly generally every three to five years, um, all 279 square miles. Um, our last flyover was 2016, um, and we're due. Um, the imagery is a useful tool for staff and the public. Um, it is on the website, Q Public Tax Assessor's website, um, and it. Um, really supports all of the um, five strategies of our strategic plan, uh, but in particular, it would be strategy C and E, which is um, economic development, um, a useful tool for that, and also public safety. Uh, we get a lot of requests from um, our EMA folks, fire, sheriff, um, and in this instance, we are sharing costs with the city of Covington and the Water Authority. Um, each will um, share like one third of the cost. Thanks, sir. Uh, Commission, any questions? I seek a motion, please. It's been motioned by um, Commissioner Schultz and second by Commissioner Mason. Any discussion? All in favor? It passes five to zero. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> uh, ne next is uh, Public Works is requ request permission to purchase a Caterpillar PM620. Uh, I think I've seen Chester. Chester. Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, sir. Well, as, as you know, um, about five months ago, our um, uh, middle machine burned up, and it's the fourth time it caught on fire, and we just gotten it repaired. And 
this electrical fire gets in the the um, hoses <clears throat> apparently were uh, leaking in those electrical short and it caught on fire and so um, we did end up getting um, about fifty one thousand dollars for it uh, it was uh, basically totaled by the the insurance company and we uh, started uh, renting a uh, caterpillar a uh, coal planer which is a, a mill machine i had a picture of it in the packets um, so we are uh, what we propose to do is purchase the one that we're renting and uh, yancey is willing to give us uh, credit for our rental payments less the uh, interest which is about twenty thousand uh, dollars for the six months and so uh, the total uh, purchase price and this is not counting the fifty one thousand we're getting <clears throat> from the insurance company is um, three hundred eighty nine thousand dollars and we'll be using the uh, SPLOS money to do that thank you sir uh, let's a motion please it's been motioned by Commissioner Edwards and second by Commissioner Cowan. Um, any discussion? All in favor? The pass is five to zero. Thank you. Next is discussion and approval to request a TAP grant for the 278 CID. Um, Ms. Morgan. Good evening. Good I'll evening. be short and sweet. Um, I'm here tonight to ask your permission to apply for a TIP solicitation, which is a TAP grant, um, LCI grant, and block, surface block grants um, uh, from the ARC. The call is due October 11th. We do not have our package complete at this date. We're waiting on some additional information from GDOT um, and uh, we're trying to determine if we will be applying for the grant including their safety and operations with us. If that's the case, it'll be a $17 million grant with a donation or with a cost um, contributed from them of $9 million, or it will be somewhere between six and $8 million for <coughs> to complete the streets, which means sidewalks on the south side, multimodal trail on the north side, landscaping, um, street lights, underground utilities, and so on. So, but I believe I need your permission to apply for this grant because you will be a sponsor. And in that case, when we do the application, I will have to have you sign a letter that says that you sponsor the project and the amount of dollars that you will commit, which is $320,000 um, from SPLOS. And um, then I'll, the city will have to specify theirs as well as GDOT will have to specify theirs. Um, once we apply for the grant, that's all we need. Once we, if we are fortunate enough to receive the grant in February, we should know. Then at that point, we will have to do an intergovernmental agency agreement. Um, that again, just restates all that. Who's gonna be responsible, which the city will be the lead agency on the grant. And they've committed to maintenance for the roundabouts and the medians. Um, and you will just be committed to the appropriation of three hundred twenty thousand dollars from SPLOST. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Schultz. So, um, is this twenty seventeen SPLOST? Yes, that's correct. And uh, what is, did that come out of that large bucket of money for public works? For no. transportation, yes, ma'am. Okay, and so was that. Was that already, was that included in that amount or is that something that we've decided since this time? It was something that you all decided since that time. Um, Ms. Morgan came to the board several months ago and if you recall, presented some information to you and um, in, order to, and in order to move ahead with the TAP grant, we would need the commitment in order for the city and the county that they would, we would do the match um, the TAP grant, the application period was delayed several times, mm -hmm. as I recall. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why she's coming back to you now to, to uh, uh, so that she can go ahead and make the application and uh, move ahead with, uh, with applying for the money. And this expenditure was recommended for approval from the SPLOS committee. They, they did, yes, ma'am.
Absolutely. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, do I have approval to go forward? I'm about to do it in a few oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner, I seek a motion, please. Thank you. It's been motioned by Commissioner Henderson and second by Commissioner Mason. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Thank Passed. you. Five to zero. Thank, Thank you. you. Next on the agenda is uh, citizens comments. This is an opportunity where we lost, allow citizens to come up and make comments. You have three minutes to do so. Please come up and state your name, your address for the record, please. <clears throat> you may come at this time. My name is Sarah Debbie, 13500 Ridge Drive. Since we had the work session at six is what brings this to mind again. As I have always advocated for the poorest of the poor, regardless of any other condition of them besides being poor and all people on fixed incomes and that elections are coming up in 2020, to please ask your state legislators to repeal the exemption from the exemption of food so that the new T-SPLOS will not be on food because the very poorest of the poor are the ones who are greatly affected by this. Many people don't realize that there is an exemption. <laughs> as the regular sales tax does. So that needs to be in the platform of candidates for office, particularly for the General Assembly. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. This is time to make comments, Commissioner Comments. You may come at this time. Please state your name, your address for the record, please. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. I'm to Michael Jones. I live at 445 Gregory Road. And we have an issue with cross traffic from uh, Alcove over to Flat Rock Road. And it kicked, the road is unpaved. And it kicks up a lot of dust and debris. And then people with breathing issues as well as that. We're just seeing if we get that road paved. Uh, a look at possibility, possibly getting that paved, you know. What's the name of that road again? Gregory Road. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Robert Bozette. I live in Jamestown Community, 510 Fourth Avenue. Uh, it's come to my attention the five years I've lived there, we have poor uh, rainwater runoff. I have no gutters and ditches to clear this water out. The few that are in there are being just inundated with sludge and dirt, trash blown about or thrown out windows. And I've had the uh, public works department was gracious enough to come out and clean these ditches and get rid of four dump truck loads of trash uh, that was just tossed out by maybe some people in the community, maybe some not. And I was wanting to know that if there's something that can be done by the commission to see about these, to, uh, there's stagnant water in some of these, a lot of children in this community. And if we could get somebody to research this to get maybe storm drains and gutters uh, to better get rainwater and storm water out uh, to where it needs to be as instead of running across the street, for example, sometimes four inches deep, I've seen it. Um, that would be nice. Can you, give, can you give me the name of the road again, please? Yes, it'll be Lee Street um, in the Jamestown community. Lee Street comes all the way to a sharp right and turns into Fourth Avenue, um, which is the lowest point in elevation of the main part, main body of the community. And the ditches just stays so full of sludge, dirt, leaves, for example, and it clutters up the uh, culvert pipes and they're not able to get, disperse this water. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Please state your name, your address for the record, please. <clears throat> Duncan Lawrence, 635th Avenue, Covington, Jamestown. I'm here on behalf of my community. I was born and raised there, and I've talked to Mr. Ronnie on different occasions. I tried to contact you, but I couldn't get you, Mr. Bain. Uh, but it's, like I said, I was born and raised there, and we can't get no support from the county. And the houses, they need help. You know, call the code enforcers. They won't give us no help. Cars <coughs> sitting around. Code enforcers won't do nothing. We just, I'm just, we just had a dead standstill with, with the county. Just wanted to reach out and see, can I get some help? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Thank you. Good evening. I'm still catching my breath from running up the stairs. Forgive me. To my commissioner and all, chairperson, everyone. I'm Rebecca Ali, and I'm a missionary in Jamestown community that uh, Mr. Lawrence just addressed. And I was supposed to be the person addressing it, but I was tied up until a few minutes ago. Anyway, um, I'm not sure what all he has said, but we've been working with our commissioner along with you, Chair. I know that you're familiar with this. Um, this coming December is gonna be two years since we started. We started the cleanup with Lori and keep Newton County clean and beautiful. We have done a few, uh, two of those cleanups actually. My commissioner has been out there several times. Um, he brought with him Carlos, don't remember Carlos' last name from Code Enforcement. And Carlos, when I first met Carlos many years ago, it was about five years ago, um, Carlos pretty much just treated me like a skirt. I was good enough to go out with him at nights and meet him at a hotel or anything of that nature but I wasn't good enough for him to realize that I am a minister of the gospel of Christ, a missionary in this community that needs something done. And so I gave up for a long time until I met our commissioner. And I thought with our commissioner being his background, the attorney of uh, one of the attorneys for the city or chairperson, I believe that I was gonna get some results and last year, when I went to one of the meetings at Good Hope, I was told that that was going to be in effect by March of this year. Now, I'm telling a community that, yes, yes, I'm showing up, I'm talking, I'm making phone calls, I'm doing everything, we're going to get something. Nothing has, almost nothing has been done. We still have all of this, the burnt house on the first street, the biggest sore in our eyes in the community, it's still there. All the other abandoned buildings that endanger our children are still there. We, we were promised better drains, you know. Nothing has happened. We got one day of garbage <coughs> pickup. And I had asked because we're out in the country, uh, countryside off of 213, all, all by ourselves. We don't have sidewalk, we don't have transportation, anything of that sort. Can something be done about the garbage pickup there more than once a year? But we really need some attention. I don't know what it will take for Newton County to give us some attention and treat us as citizens. Okay, we don't pay a whole lot of taxes. Our zip code is not, oh, you guys live there? You know, what is it we need to do? Do we look, we, do, we don't have the right color, we don't have the right gender, we don't have the right zip code. What is it that we have to do to get something done in our community? It's been years. It's been years and we've been patient. This December will be two years. Thank you, I am sure if this was other neighborhoods in our city, Thank you, our county, it would be different. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for Thank hearing you. me. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Anyone else? 
Commissioner Edwards. Thank you. Commissioner Mason. Commissioner Schultz. Commissioner Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and this won't be long. Uh, I just want to just touch on the um, ethylene oxide issue that we that we have in Covington. That seem that is a crisis. Almost it seems to be a crisis. This is not the first time something like that has happened, but the um, tactics that they normally take are the same. Like in Cellar Grove community, when uh, um, uh, uh, Global um, SRG Global company, when they was uh, when when uh, TCE was being leaked or had been leaked upon the earth and went under some bedrock and the fumes were coming up, they came out and they put they put monitors in people's homes and some they paid $150, some they paid more. But make a long story short, that too caused cancer. Same tactic, what they did was that, hey, they went and got the best lawyers they could find, they went and, then they went and got the best media people they could find and it blew it away. Everybody forgot about it. And there was a lot of people who had cancer out there too. And still do, but there was something else coming that way. There was the BD, CR, uh, SR, SRG BD uh, board, and the toxin was through there. So they had double jeopardy. And when I was talking to people, one lady made now 10 people who had died from cancer just in that community. We don't have to do nothing, don't have to say nothing. But when it comes to your house and where you live, hey, it'll be a whole different story when it's one of your loved ones uh, who have or dying from cancer, and you wonder where it's coming from, and people will come from everywhere to say, "Oh, it's okay." They get up and your I call it the horse and pony show. I know they get mad at me, but it's okay. Horse and pony show and say it's all right. They don't live in your community. Don't know nothing about the community. Don't even know the folks, and they are gonna tell you it's all right. <clears throat> Damn, it's okay. It's okay. Keep on listening. And keep on putting these same folks in office, and they're going to continue to do the same thing to you that they've been doing for years, and they're going to let it keep continue to be health risks in our community. Uh, Cellar Grove housing project where the poor people live. That's where they put those, that type of stuff at. It's going to be the same stuff. Keep on going for them. And you'll find yourself, it's going to stop blowing this way, back this way where, where most of my constituents live, going to start blowing your way. So I say we need to put a stop. And I tell you what, what the stop is going to be. You need to pull their permit. I'm telling you, you don't believe me. It's the truth. You pull their permit until we get this under control. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Cow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the people from Jamestown are absolutely right. And I've mentioned this to code enforcement and the county <clears throat> manager over the last couple of years. That needs to be some work down there. I know we've tightened up some of our code enforcement stuff. I know our probate judge is willing to, to deal with those issues if we can get them in front of them. So I will, you know, I was kind of waiting until we added those additional code enforcement officers. I really think Jamestown is a full time area down there to get something going. And if I just had a, just let me borrow a front end loader, I go down there and clean it up. But I know it, that's not, <laughs> that's going to get me in trouble. But uh, there has a lot of problems with, with water drainage. They're absolutely right. Um, and I don't blame them. I don't, I don't understand exactly what they mean by uh, they're tired of waiting because uh, it does need some cleanup down there. And that's a nice neighborhood down there. I mean, everybody's always worried about going to Jamestown. I didn't know. It didn't bother me one bit. It is nice. Yeah. And people are very friendly. And um, it was a good area down there. Um, but they do need some help from the county. So I would just ask for the county manager and, and, and Judy and, and your code enforcement people just to start being a little more aggressive in some of those abandoned properties. Um, and to address the issues of <clears throat> the ETO tonight, I'm not going to go as far as JC and say pull their permit. I uh, understand that logic, but I don't think we're there yet. <laughs> But I do think, you know, I listened very intently to what they said. They, they did, Nancy, I appreciate you asking them coming because they did provide a lot more information. Um, but I'm, I'm still feel like uh, one, note, one note I made on what she said was they have no idea how far ethylene, uh, ETO, ethylene oxide travels. They think it's less than a mile, but 
she wasn't sure about that at all. They don't know that they, and they said they needed thoughtful data collection, need a methodology for determining <clears throat> the meaning of the data that's collected, and I agree with all that. Still, though, the point is data needs to be collected. And we need to we need to cross that threshold first and say, okay, we're going to commit to data collection. Figuring out the nuts and bolts of that, you can give that to the expert. But we've got to at some point say we're willing to do additional testing in the county and, and identify what the costs are going to be and we'll be willing to address that. That's just my opinion on that. Um, but I want to assure the community that I think everybody here on this board of commissioners is committed to make sure that we eliminate any possible health and safety hazards in the community. <clears throat> I just want people to understand that. We will, we will move forward with that, I'm sure, at some point. Thank you. Thank you, sir. There is a need for an executive session tonight, so I seek a motion that, and I don't think we, we will not be taking a vote um, for litigation purposes. Um, I seek a motion that we move into an executive session. It's been motioned by Commissioner um, uh, Henderson and second by Commissioner Edwards. All in favor? We are in executive session. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Wow.